Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to LifeHouse. My name is Megan Brown, and it's so excited to be back. I've been around this church for a long time and just excited to spend a few moments with you all this morning, especially if this is your first time. I know it can be a lot to walk into a place for the first time, and so we hope you leave today feeling encouraged, connected, and hopefully we can see you again next week. So there's a lot of exciting things that we get to celebrate this morning. I mean, March Madness is totally in action. I know there's some upsets, but we can move past it. But also, Crestview Knights, they are on their way to the state tournament. And can we just give it up for them? I mean, that is such a big deal. So cool. Some of you are probably gonna rush out of here as soon as service is over to try to make the game, but the rest of us will be cheering them on from Van Wert. So that's super cool. Another thing that we get to celebrate this morning is something that has been happening for about 2,000 years. And we believe it is one of the most important things that we can do around here, and that's baptism. And what baptism is, is simply a public declaration of somebody's faith. So today, we get to witness two of those baptisms, two high school girls, Aaliyah and Peyton, and they are sitting over here. So girls, go ahead and stand up, and can we just cheer them on? So cool. You guys can have a seat, that is awesome. And so just to hear their stories and to see where their faith was and where it's going, it is such a powerful thing and it's just awesome that we get to celebrate that as a church. And so when that happens, please stand up, make some noise and just celebrate as big as we can. So in the meantime, the band's gonna play a couple songs. So I would love to invite you to stand and get ready to sing together.
spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me for I took a breath
want you to know one thing today, that God loves you and he chases after you, whether we know that or not. You guys can have your seat. And as you do, um, uh, like Meg said, Aaliyah is here today and she has given her life to Jesus, put her trust in Jesus and, and listen to that call of God in her life. So we want to listen to her story and check out her baptism. Turn your attention to the screens. Hi, my name is Aaliyah, and I'm here to share my story on how I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So growing up, I remember going to multiple different churches, and we eventually stopped going and coming to Lifehouse when I was in second grade, and from the first day, it felt like home. I've always considered myself a believer, but growing up, I thought a true believer meant you had to follow certain rules, and if you don't follow those rules, then you are a burden to Christ. Last year was a really rough patch in my life. I struggled with a lot of mental health problems and felt like I was never gonna be forgiven for some of the poor choices I made. It was really hard for me to comprehend what was wrong and I always questioned, why is God doing this to me? I started new relationships with people who have helped me grow my relationship and faith and have a better understanding what it's like being a follower of Christ. To me, finding forgiveness in Christ means even though you have sin, no matter how little or big, you are still forgiven. Through the hard times, I kept coming to church and lean towards God, and that's how I knew I was forgiven. I see Christ in my mom. She is the main reason why I am where I am today with my faith, and she is one of my biggest supporters and has always been there for me. Another person who has helped me grow in my faith is my sister Peyton. We have definitely grown in our faith together, and when we're struggling, we pick each other back up and keep each other accountable of coming to church. Lifehouse has helped me grow my faith in many ways. Ellie, Meg, and Maddie, and all my other past group leaders have helped me a lot. I also lead a group of kindergarten girls in first service. They really are my pride and joy, and helping them in their faith has also impacted me a lot. I'm Aaliyah Blackmore, and I'm here today to let you know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Aaliyah, it's an honor just to be a part of your story, to watch you grow over the past year, and when I think of your faith, I just think of steadiness. I think of even in your lowest moments, you were steady with Jesus. And when I think about that, I think about those girls that are sitting right there that you have poured your time and your energy in. And they look at you and they say, I want a faith like Aaliyah and I want to love because I've seen her love like Jesus. And it is an honor just to see you continue to grow in that. And so today, with your declaration of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Come here. This is the sound of a child Awesome. You guys can take your seat. Well, it is an honor to get to celebrate and cheer Aaliyah on. And if you're new here and you're like, what in the world just happened? You know, everybody's standing and clapping and cheering and you've never experienced that in church. You just need to know. And this is emotional for all of us. 
that I'll be I'll get there. Those are our biggest wins around here. This that is why we created this church and work so hard to do what we do. And just know, we love all the things about our church, all the wonderful people in the parking lot and in the lobby, the kids' music and all this music and lights and smoke, and it's all so much fun, and we love that. But that is why we do everything that we do around here, to see a young lady. Yeah, that's appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> to see a young person, a high school student, give their lives to Jesus and then to say I want to follow and obey and I want my life to be directed by you and I know a lot of you have said to me if I would have been told those things when I was 16 or 17 years old my life would have been completely different and that's why we, we do what we do and that is our biggest win and I just want to thank you for making a church that provides space for students and adults and children to discover Jesus and a relationship with him. We are so grateful for what God is doing in this place. And right now, it is just piping hot. We're watching this happen so in so many incredible ways, and we're so excited about it. So to Leah's family, to her small group leaders, thank you for all that you poured into her along the way. So that's really good. We're going to continue on with our service this morning. Um, you may notice I'm up here with a cane. Um, I had old man hip replacement surgery about 10 days ago, and I'm healing up fine. It's been a harder journey than I anticipated, but I'm healing up fine. Everybody's been asking. Um, so just know that. But um, I'm not quite ready to communicate this morning, so we get to hear an incredible message from our video teaching. Pastor Andy Stanley and I listened to it again this week and it is phenomenal so lean in and pay attention there's steps to take after it in your own personal journey and hopefully next week I'll be back in the rotation ready to rock and roll but just know this it is just really good for me to be here with you this morning love you check out Andy's message Do you know who, it's, who it is uh, virtually impossible not to like? Who it is virtually impossible not to want to be like or to be um, more like? It's that person who stopped, who went out of their way to help you and didn't expect or require anything from you. They, they saw you in need and they saw a need and they just met it. Um, they saw that something needed to be done and they just stepped up and they did it. And they didn't just walk by and talk themselves out of it. When, when you have an experience like that, and we've all had those experiences, I hope, um, you, just, you just never forget those folks. I'll tell you one of mine, it's very odd. And I've never told this story before because it's a little long and it's a little odd, but I'm gonna try to take several hours and shrink it down. I was in Florida, I went to an event I woke up that morning, I didn't wanna eat breakfast, so I didn't eat breakfast, I went to the event. It was a half day event, they, had, they provided lunch. I didn't, the lunch didn't look appetizing, so I didn't eat lunch. So then I went to the airport and um, I had a late, late, early evening flight and I thought, well, I'll just get some work done. So I work, 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 nothing at the airport looked up appetizing to me, I was trying to eat healthy, I still do, but I was, this is, this is by the way, this is like 14 years ago, that's important because it was before Uber, which is important in just a minute in the story. Um, in fact, I think Uber launched the next year, actually. But anyway, so I so then the flights delayed because there was bad weather in Atlanta. So I'm in Florida. So we're wait, wait, wait. So the flights delayed two hours. The plane gets there. They said, "Hey, it's a quick turnaround." You know, the, and so it's a short flight. So we get on, pull off away from the gate. Bad weather in Atlanta. We sit there two and a half more hours. 
So I haven't had breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Um, and I've never had blood sugar problems before, so I didn't really know what was going on in my, um, my, my body. So anyway, I land, we land, um, I check the bag, I get to the baggage claim, and I can't read the screen. It's like totally blurry about which, where my bag So I thought, I've had my contacts in all day, so I pop my contacts out and put my glasses on, and everything's still kind of blurry. I finally get my bag, get in the little, you know, little bus thing that takes you out to the hinterland to find my car. Fortunately, I remembered um, which aisle I was on because I was having a hard time reading my phone. And silly me, you know, this is now, it's about 11 o'clock at night. It's hardly anybody out there. I get in my car. I get lost in the parking lot to get out of the parking lot because I can't see things are getting blurrier and blurry. I'm like, what is happening to me? Didn't have any other symptoms. Um, so then this was, I don't want to advise this, okay? If I, this is probably why I haven't shared the story before. I thought, well, I'll, this is going to get better. So I make my way to the highway. So I'm on 85, I'm going through town and I am, now I'm sweating. I got the windows down, I got the air conditioner on. I keep checking my pulse. Am I having a heart attack? I'm like, what is happening? But I, it's getting worse and worse. So I've got the flashers on, I'm in the right-hand lane. Um, is anybody feeling anxiety. I want to get through this quick before I trigger your anxiety. I know it's, but that's why I haven't shared the story before. Anyway, it, it works out. I'm here. But anyway, so I'm, um, so I'm in my Land Cruiser. I had this old Land Cruiser and I'm in the right lane, flashers on, and I'm praying. And here's what I'm praying. And it's not because I'm a great person, but I was praying, God, please don't let me hurt anybody. Cause I thought I am about to pass out and I'm going to wreck my car and hurt somebody. I find, so I'm downtown Atlanta. I finally get to an exit. I, I get off. And this is what I remember. I remember pulling up at the end of the exit ramp and there's this giant red light in the sky. And I realized that's a red light. My vision is so blurry. It's about this big around. Okay. I'm sitting there, I'm trying to, you know, breathe, you know, and I've got all this anxiety. I look over, I see this blurry white and blue kind of neon looking thing. I'm thinking that has to be a Chevron station or some sort of gas station. I take a right and I get in the parking lot. Uh, and I was, I mean, I've never experienced anything like this. So I'm sitting there thinking, what am I gonna do? I'm downtown Atlanta, so I get out, I go in, I walk to the back of the place, I'm looking for some orange juice because by now I'm thinking, okay, this has gotta be a blood sugar thing. So I, th this is a place, they, they don't sell much orange juice, okay? So I'm, <laughs> I wanna be polite, okay? So finally I find something orange juice-ish and I'm just drinking this stuff and I realize, I look over and there's the guy, there's only one guy in there, he works there and he's behind, behind like this three inch bulletproof glass. This is where I am, okay? And he's looking at me like, are you gonna pay for that? So I walk over and I'm like, I'm having a little bit of a medical thing. I think I'm gonna be fine. I said, I need you to call my wife. He said, well, we can't use the phone except for business. I'm like, no, I, I want you to use my phone. I can't, I couldn't read my phone, that's how bad it was. So I talk him into it. He calls Sandra, hands it back. I say, honey, I'll be fine. I'm just gonna be late. She says, you want me to come get you? I'm like, no, I'm gonna figure this out. Then I say, and now I need you to call me a cab. He's like, well, we can't, this is just a business. I said, we've covered that. I said, here's my phone, you know. I mean, I was polite and he was trying, but you know, he's like, what's this crazy guy? And I'm all dressed up, okay? And it's, you know, it's midnight and he's wondering what's going on. And he's seen everything, I think. Anyway, so he calls a cab. So I'm waiting, waiting, thinking this is gonna get better. It's not, you know, I, it's hard to tell if it's getting better, but I'm not about to get in my car and drive. Okay, that was not an option. So up drive, so I'm outside and um, <laughs> there's, there's so much to this story. People kept asking me for money because I'm all dressed up and, you know, so I'm like, sure, I'm just happy that I'm not driving the car, you know, so give away a little bit of cash. Anyway, so up drives this um, car and, and, and it wasn't really an actual cab. It's the guy just stuck something on the top. This is again before Uber, okay. Um, and out gets this Middle East, out walks this little Middle Eastern young man, probably in his 20s. And I said, hey, I call the cab. I said, hey, um, this is my car. And I'm trying to explain to him um, that I shouldn't be driving. And I can tell he thinks I'm drunk. I'm like, I'm not drunk. I said, it's a medical thing. I said, so really, I don't just need a ride home. I need somebody to drive me home. Otherwise, my car is gonna be stuck down here and tomorrow and I'm trying to just think through the day. And he's kind of looking at me, he says, okay, hold on, I have a friend who might can help. So he gets on his phone and he says, I have a friend in Marietta. Now, for those of you who don't live in the Atlanta area, I'm downtown, I live in a city called Mar Alpharetta, that's one way, and Marietta's a different way and it's midnight. So he's calling his friend in Marietta and I'm like, are you sure? He goes, yeah, but he couldn't get him and he couldn't get him, finally gets him. And he says, okay, I'll, he's gonna meet us. If you'll just tell me what exit we get off the highway, he's gonna meet us there. And then he'll just, you know, we'll go to your house and then he'll drive me back down here. 
I'm like, really? He said, yeah, man, it's okay. I'm like, are you sure? He goes, oh yeah, it's, a fine. it's fine. I'm like, okay. And I, so anyway, so I give this guy I just met um, my car key and I get in the car with him. I get in the passenger seat, he's in the driver's seat and off we go. And um, as we're getting on, you know, 85 to head back through the connector, head back through the town, it dawned on me, I've not even, I've, I've been just so focused on myself. I said, I'm so sorry. What is your name? He said, my name is Muhammad. And I said, well, I told, I'd already told him my name. I said, well, Muhammad, I'm a pastor and I cannot wait to tell my friends and my wife that I was saved by Muhammad. <laughs> and he didn't get it. I don't think he got it. I just thought this is perfect. I'm being saved by my, so he drives me all the way. So we finally get to the exit. By this time I'm, you know, I can see, I mean, I law, it was terrible. I, again, I'd learned later, this is, if you get to that part of blood sugar issues, you, there's only two more levels and then you're out. So I, it was bad, but anyway. So we get to the gas station and I said, hey, you know, just pull over right here, tell your friend to meet us here. Um, and so it took about 30 minutes for his buddy to get there. I mean, they've gone way out of their way for this stranger. So I go into the gas station there, the new exit, the ATM, and I'm gonna get out all the money I can to give these guys. I'm so grateful. All I could get was $200, which, and, and he didn't even wanna take that. He's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, I can't, I was just so extraordinarily grateful. His buddy shows up. I hug both of them. They're like my best friends. Thank you. You know, you, you really have, you know, I just felt like they, they both saved me. And the, and the moral of the story is when stuff like that happens, I know that's kind of dramatic. You, you just don't forget people like that because they came to the rescue. Now, some of you are listening to that story and you're thinking, Andy, that's, that's pretty dramatic, but you know what? I think it might've been better if you hadn't told us the guy was Middle Eastern and his name was Muhammad. You could have left that part off. And if that bothers you a little bit, you're not gonna believe what Jesus says in today's episode, of part four of investigating Jesus. Investigating Jesus, how we know and why we Follow now, um, as we've said throughout this series, this is these are really important issues right here because we're asking the question: How do we know there's anything? There's even anything to the story of Jesus? And if there is something to the story of Jesus, why should we bother to follow? Because the invitation to follow Jesus is all encompassing. It includes your time and your money and your relationships and your career and your school. I mean, following Jesus it's a, it's an all or nothing kind of proposition. So for modern people to consider following Jesus, I mean, we better have a really, really, really good reason. And the other reason it's such an important issue is because Christianity, Christianity, or I should say the credibility of Christianity actually rises and falls on the identity of this single individual, Jesus of Nazareth, which means, and we've said this each time in this series, which means if you are considering faith, or if you are reconsidering faith, or if you are in the process of unconsidering faith, there's really just one pertinent question for you to wrestle with. And the question is not, does God exist? I mean, that's fun to talk about. The question isn't, is the entire Bible true? That's fun to talk about as well. But the issue when it comes to Christianity really boils down to this. Is Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John a reliable account of actual events? And if any, of these one, if any of these four accounts of the life of Jesus are true, then regardless of what you believed in the past or where you've been or what you've done, you should sit up straight. We should all sit up straight and pay attention because if these are any one of these is a reliable account of actual events, then what Jesus did actually, he, he actually did or what it says that, he, that Jesus did, he actually did. And what he taught, he actually taught. So the issue is one or more of the gospels, all of Christianity rises and falls on that question. So in this series, we're actually just exploring one of the accounts of the life of Jesus written by Luke, named actually for the author Luke, who apparently was a first century doctor who knew the main characters in the story of Jesus. He knew Peter, he traveled all over the Mediterranean rim with the apostle Paul. He knew James, the brother of Jesus. And right up front, as we've said throughout in, the, in his gospel, right up front, he tells us that he's not writing religious literature. This isn't sacred religious literature. He, he's actually just documenting someone's life, the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And he wasn't 
alone because the events surrounding the life of Jesus were so amazing, were, were just so um, life-changing, and not just life-changing, but culture-shifting, the story had to be told. So here, here's what he says at the very beginning of his account of the life of Jesus. He says, many, I'm not the only one, and many isn't four, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled or the things that happened among us, right here among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first, eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So Luke is not writing the Bible. Luke is just telling us what happened. And later this first century document would be included in the documents that make up what we call the Bible. So he starts off by detailing Jesus' birth. Then as we said in part two, then he introduces us to the warm-up back, John the Baptist. And then he gives us a summary of Jesus' entire life mission. He said that Jesus said this, I must proclaim, I must proclaim the good news. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. That is why I was sent. So Luke's like, here's Jesus' mission statement to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And we said last time, if the version of faith that you were raised on or raised in or the version of faith that you're a part of right now, if it doesn't strike you as good news, it's probably not the Jesus version. And the whole idea of the kingdom of God, Jesus presenting the kingdom of God, this represents the reign and the rule of God. And Luke says, this is what was so amazing about Jesus. When Jesus talked about God's rule, either on earth or over the life of a person, it was inviting, it was relational, it was, it was without borders. It was as if, Luke would tell us, it was as if everybody was invited and everybody was included. That Luke would say, look, Luke would tell us, and, and we'll discover as, as you read the Gospel of Luke. It's like he said, it's like Jesus was saying that God doesn't recognize and God has little patience for the artificial stratification of the human race that every single culture and every single generation tries to impose on the human race. That everyone was endowed with certain inherent worth. That everybody had value. That everybody was made in the image of God. And that the caste system or the caste type systems that again permeated ancient time world and permeate parts of the world today, Jesus had no patience for that because his father had no patience for that because that's not how he viewed the world, that everyone should be treated with dignity and worth, which by the way, is, is really kind of self-evident to us, but it was not self-evident in the ancient world. And it wasn't self-evident until Jesus. And wherever Jesus followers stubbornly embraced, wherever they stubbornly embraced, defended and modeled Jesus' new covenant command to love others as God through Christ has loved us, people flourished. The world was a better place. And all the caste systems and the differentiating of types of people, all of that began to fall away. So on one occasion, um, Jesus spoke about this directly and Luke documents this occasion where Jesus really goes out of his way to reiterate this new and unique vision for his followers, which was a new and unique vision for the world. And it's like Luke leans in and says, okay, this is so important. This is why I included this. This is, this is, how, this is how epic the, the words of Jesus, this is why this story had to be told. Here's what he says, Luke chapter 10. On one occasion, on one occasion, an expert in the law, a lawyer, stood up to test Jesus. He, did, he had a question, but it was a test. That's important. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, eternal life in the first century, first, first century Judeans, what he's asking is, how do I know I get to participate in God's future kingdom? How do I get to participate in God's future kingdom? That's what eternal life, that's what they meant by eternal life. In other words, this attorney wants to make sure he's got a reserved seat. Now he's testing Jesus, but he's also genuinely curious because the answer to the question, how do you reserve a seat in God's future kingdom, wasn't all that clear from the law and the prophets. But Jesus is smart and he knows that this is a test and he knows that there's a question behind the question. So Jesus did what Jesus does, he responds, with a question. So he says, well, you're a lawyer. What is written in the law? 
How do you read it? In other words, you tell us and you tell me and we'll both know. I mean, you're a lawyer. You, you're, you should know this, right? So then the lawyer, as you may know, because this is such a uh, familiar story, the lawyer recites back to Jesus and Jesus' audience what they were all taught as children is kind of the synopsis of the law that somehow should point the way to making sure you have a reserve seat in God's future kingdom. So he says back to Jesus, well, this is how I read it. This is what I think the answer is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind. Now, this is an important part of the story. Earlier, somebody had asked Jesus a similar question. And when Jesus, and in that case, Jesus actually recited this back as the answer to the question asked, but he added a part that we're all familiar with from Leviticus 19, verse 18. He added the phrase, and your neighbor as yourself. Because somebody had said, hey, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, well, there's not greatest commandment. There's two greatest commandments. And they're actually the same commandment because they are actually different sides of the same coin. Now this, when Jesus added, and your neighbor as yourself, to what was kind of a formulaic answer to, the, to first century Judeans, it caused quite a stir. But the reason Jesus added, and your neighbor as yourself, because he was making a point. And this is when Luke wants to lean in and say, and this is the point. His point was that love for God is demonstrated by love for others. That love for God, this was Jesus, the point of his ministry. This is why it's good news. This is why the reign and rule of God is not something to be resisted. That love for God is demonstrated by love for others. Well, anyway, apparently this lawyer was there when Jesus added on and your neighbor as yourself. So he recites kind of the Sunday school answer to the question of how, do, how can I know for sure I'm gonna have eternal life? Then he smiles at Jesus and he adds, and I've been listening, Jesus, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Jesus is so happy. Somebody is finally paying attention and starting to get this, right? And Jesus looks at him and says something that Jesus almost never says in the gospels. You have answered correctly because mostly people answer Jesus incorrectly. So this is like, this guy's feeling pretty good about himself. Jesus replied, do this, do this. What's this? This isn't the love of the Lord your God, their heart, soul, mind, and strength because you can't measure that. You have no idea. Do this is referring specifically to the last part and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do, Jesus said, hey, Mr. Judean, Judean lawyer, you'll have a reservation in God's future kingdom. All right, anybody else have a question? But the lawyer doesn't sit down because he's not finished. And the text says, Luke tells us, because somebody who was there told Luke, but he, the lawyer, was just like us. He wanted to justify himself. Don't we all? Don't, don't you want to think that you're okay? That you and God are fine? That you and God, you know, it's all worked out, you know? That you and Jesus got it all worked out, you know? Eric Church says, me and Jesus got that all worked out, you know, right? Isn't that how we are? Or don't we all want to justify ourselves? Of course we do. So he doesn't sit back down. He, he says, so he asked Jesus. This is the second part of the question. Okay, all right, if I'm gonna reserve, you know, spot in God's future kingdom, I gotta love my neighbor as myself, but you, we, you, you gotta be more specific than that. And who, here's the famous question. And who is my neighbor? Now, this is how this question was an attempt to justify himself. What he's really asking is, what is the minimum amount of neighbor loving required to reserve a spot in God's future kingdom? Okay, don't just tell me, love, that's too open-ended. I want, you gotta be, I, I wanna know, what is the minimum Amount. Now, for first century, not every century, but for first century Judeans, a neighbor was another Judean. This was very ethnocentric. To love a ne your neighbors were other Judeans because they were, you know, Rome was there. There were the different countries that were, had become part of that culture. And so they're, you know, they're sort of taking care of themselves. So his question is, which subset of my Judean brothers and sisters do I have to love? Hoping he had already met the requirement. And then once again, in typical Jesus fashion, Jesus didn't answer the question he asked. Jesus answers the question that he should have asked because the real question isn't who is my neighbor. The real question that Jesus wanted him to understand was this question, what does neighbor love look like? And what does neighbor love act like? 
because Jesus' actual agenda was this question. What is God like? And then, as many of you know, Jesus launches into the most disruptive, culturally insensitive, disorienting, paradigm-shifting parable of all of his ministry. And it is a parable that we all know, which is amazing because it's 2,000 years old and people all over the world in almost every language know this story. But more important than knowing the story, Jesus' point is simply this. This is what it looks like to follow me because this is what your father in heaven is like. So he smiles. The man's still standing there. Everybody's waiting for an answer to the question. Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. (laughs) And everybody's like, wait, weren't we just talking about neighbors? Now we're talking about robbers, but this is what Jesus did because everybody's leaning in because they know this is going somewhere. And this was familiar context for them because anybody going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, everybody knew that path. It's about 17 miles. Um, it's rocky, there's caves, there's desert. It was dangerous. It's, it's, it's always a little bit dangerous. It was so dangerous back then. So this man, this is something that that happened all the time and could have happened to anyone in Jesus' audience. So he's on his way from from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he's set upon by robbers and then Jesus continues and they stripped him of his clothes because clothes were very valuable. They stripped him of his clothes and they beat him and they went away leaving him half dead. And immediately everybody in Jesus' audience knew what would happen next. The sun would go down, either the cold would kill him or animals would find him and they would eat him before he had already passed away. This happened all the time. Then Jesus goes on. Now, remember, this is a parable. Jesus is making the whole thing up. This, none of this, this, is, this could have happened, but this is a made-up story in order to make a single point, and everybody's leaning in. And of course, the lawyer's like, I hope we get back to the neighbor thing, but go ahead, this is fascinating, right? <laughs> Jesus says, and then these two religious people, one actually, it appears from what Jesus said, coming from Jerusalem, so they're all ceremonially clean and all buttoned up with God. These two religious people come by and they see their bruised and bleeding Judean neighbor and they don't lift a finger. In fact, they probably thought to themselves, well, you know what? He probably deserved this. I mean, this is fate. This is karma. Besides, the law forbids us to kill anyone, but the law does not require us to keep someone from dying. So they didn't. Now, if his audience was paying close attention, and I wanna make sure we are, if his audience was paying close attention, and if Jesus' greatest hits formula was correct, that you love the Lord your God, the whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, Well, then these two guys are doomed. The two religious guys are doomed because they did not love their Judean neighbor, which meant they did not love the Lord, their God, even though they were on their way or coming from the city of Jerusalem. And then Jesus pauses for dramatic effect because he's the master storyteller. And he says, but there was another one. Another person came by, but a Samaritan Now, everybody in Jesus' audience is like, oh, you know, because they probably assumed if this was a real story, a Samaritan is probably who robbed the guy to begin with. Because the Judeans and Samaritans, as you know, if you grew up in church, didn't get along. In fact, Judeans considered Samaritans the least respectable of all people. And consequently, as you would imagine, the Samaritans kind of returned the favor because of how they were looked down on and because of how they were treated. In fact, two days before Jesus tells this story, (laughs) Jesus and the disciples are going to go through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem instead of going around. And um, so he sends a couple of his disciples ahead to a Samaritan village and asks permission to spend the night there. And the Samaritans tell Jesus and his disciples, you're not welcome here. You're on your way to Jerusalem and you're Galileans or Judeans and you are not welcome here. And James and John, Jesus' two disciples, come to Jesus. This is amazing. And they say to Jesus, Jesus, they won't let us spend the night in their Samaritan village. Is it okay if we call down fire and destroy the whole village? (laughs) Jesus is like, what? Yeah, let's just kill them all. It's like, oh. God, I thought we were further along than that. It's like, no, we're not gonna call down fire and burn up the village. The point is, there's a lot, of, a lot going on between Judeans and Samaritans. And now Jesus, it looks like, he, he's, looks like he's about to make a Samaritan the hero of this parable. But a 
Samaritan. And his audience is thinking, wait, wait, wait. Surely you're not about to make him the hero. But he did. But it's even worse than that. If you paid attention to Jesus' parables, and I don't know that Jesus' audience did, but his uh, disciples certainly did. Because in every single parable that Jesus would tell, there is someone that represents God the Father. And the disciples, Peter and the guys are like, oh no, oh no, oh no. He's about to make a Samaritan the God figure in the parable. We're never gonna get this venture off the ground. Does he not understand our culture? I mean, this is like the worst thing he could do. But a Samaritan, you know this story, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He did something. And then Jesus makes this Samaritan out to be the extra mile, are you kidding me? Who would even think about doing that variety of hero. In fact, there are six, I counted six, there may be more, six or more expressions of compassion. So Jesus just, he's just packing it on, he's just loading it on, he's just twisting the knife. He says this, he went, this imaginary Samaritan who came upon this imaginary Judean who had been uh, robbed, he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, which meant he touched him. He poured oil and wine on the wounds, which means it cost him. Then he put the man on his own donkey, which meant it, you know, he had to go out of his way. Now he's gonna have to walk and go slower instead of ride. And he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. And the audience is like, wait, wait, wait. The guy spends the night and Jesus just rubs it in it. This wasn't a dump and run. He spent the night caring for this guy. Then the next day, I mean, the, the audience, can, this is just beyond imagination. Nobody would do this. Then the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. And immediately they do the math in their mind. They're like, are you kidding? This would take care of the guy for like two weeks. You just paid like two weeks of room and board for someone you don't even know. And in the parable, the Samaritan says to the innkeeper, hey, I gotta go, but I want you to look after him. And when I return, oh no, you're gonna come back? Oh yeah, I'm gonna come back and check on this guy. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Silence. Nobody can, this is, this is beyond the pale. And what in the world does this have to do with neighbors? Okay, this is, you, you just made up a story no one could ever believe. You lost us as soon as he touched the guy, right? The lawyer's confused. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Jesus follower, you walked away. I, I don't even know how to put words around this next moment. But it's undeniable what I'm about to say because this actually happened. But again, it's just a reminder of the 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 weight of Jesus' teaching and how it has shaped culture, cultures all over the world. What Jesus did next, his immediate audience would not live long enough to appreciate. Because Jesus was about to redefine neighbor for everyone in every generation and in every nation. Neighbor would no longer be primarily about ethnicity, proximity, do you like me? Jesus expands the idea of neighbor beyond Judea and Galilee. He expands it beyond people you know and don't know. In fact, he expands it beyond the, the borders of their scripture. And what's so brilliant, this is why, nobody could make this up. Luke is, again, Luke's just trying to, about to come off the page, like, can you believe this? And I haven't even got to the best part yet. And Jesus does all of that for every generation and every nation with one perfectly timed, perfectly created, perfectly delivered question. And it's a question that forces me and it's a question that forces you and it's a question that forces everybody everywhere to examine their hearts, our hearts, and our prejudices, and our contempt for folks who don't look like us, and who don't live like us, who don't believe like us, who don't act like us, who don't worship like us, who don't vote like us, who are basically nothing like us, who don't even like us. And 2,000 years later, 2,000 years later, the weight of this annoying question still rests 
on our shoulders. I, it's annoying. It's annoying because we all know the answer to the question and it's inescapable. So Jesus looks at the lawyer after he finishes the parable and he says this. Okay, I got a question for you. You've been asking me questions. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Now, if they've been paying attention and if you've been paying attention and if we've been paying attention, the implication behind this question to go way beyond the excitement and the drama of the parable. Here's what the question really comes down to. Which of these three loved God? Which of these three loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength by loving a stranger as him? Self. And the problem for the lawyer standing there is this if he answers this question out loud, he's accountable to his answer. It's worse than that. If you answer this question out loud, or if you answer this question out loud, or if I answer this question out loud, I'm accountable to my answer for the question. And the lawyer, surrounded by Judeans primarily, he can't even bring himself to answer the question directly. The, the text says, Luke tells us, the, the expert in the law required, Jesus says, which one of the three? There's just three. There's two that walk by and there's one that helps. Which one of the three was a neighbor? And he's like, the, uh, the um, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the one, the, the one, couldn't even say Samaritan. But, you know, the, the one who had, mercy on him. The one who saw a need, met it. The one that saw there was something to do that they could do and they did it. The one that didn't talk themselves out of it. Jesus smiles, and looks at him, looks at his audience, looks at me, looks at you, looks at us. He says, all right, tell you what, go. Just do that. Do you, do, you, do you want to participate in the kingdom of God on earth? Do, do you want to live your life in sync with God's activity in the world? Do you want to see thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth right now in your earth, on your world as it is in heaven? He would say to his audience, then just, just, just go do that. When you see a need, you can meet, meet it. When there's something you know you can do, do it. Don't talk yourself out of it. Just go, they hated this part. This is maybe why he didn't say it. These are my words, not his. Just, he was basically saying, just go be the Samaritan in the parable. And suddenly neighbor love has no boundaries. And neighbor love didn't because God's love doesn't. And this is when Luke just wants to come off the page and grab me by the collar and put his hand behind your head and pull you up close and say, can you believe this? Nobody thought this way. Nobody lived this way. Nobody could even imagine a community like that. Nobody could imagine a world like that. And Jesus asked this perfect question. And by the time Luke writes his gospel, it's already having ripple effects through Judea and Galilee and Samaria and the apostle Paul and others are gonna take it to the uttermost parts of the earth. And what was not self-evident in the ancient world is so self-evident to us because of the teaching and the life of Jesus. And somehow Luke knew this is the story that has to outlive me and outlive my generation. It's the story that had to be told because it was the story for everyone and every generation. Because when you hear the story, you know that if we live that way, the world would change. It would change everything. So back to us. So which, which one of the three do you think do I think, which one of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? <laughs> Don't answer it out loud or you'll be accountable. But 
If you wanna see God's kingdom come and see God's will be done, if you are a Jesus follower and not just an admirer, Jesus does not need any more admirers. He has plenty of admirers. He has plenty of believers. He needs doers because it's the doers that change the world. It's the doers, not even the prayers, the change, the where you can walk by a wounded man and pray that somebody will stop and help him. And that is not loving the Lord your God. And I know this is challenging and I know it's like, how far do we take it? And again, we wanna justify ourselves. I get it, I wanna justify myself. But do you wanna change the world? Do you wanna change the community? Do you wanna see change? It's very simple. Jesus gave us the formula. <laughs> he wraps it up in that horrible, wonderful question. You wanna see, for those of you, faith has gotten boring for you. Church has gotten boring for you. In fact, one of the reasons you're losing faith is because there's just nothing to it. You know why there's nothing to it? You're not doing it. You're just believing it or disbelieving it or debating it. But you step into a realm when you see something that needs to be done, do it. And when there's a need you think you can meet, you meet it. And you get in a little deep and a little bit over your head and suddenly you're praying like never before. And suddenly your faith comes to life like maybe it's never been alive before. This is the life Jesus invites us into. And to live any other kind of life is to simply be religious. You wanna see your faith come alive, come back to life? Go, this is Jesus' words, not mine, go. Do likewise. Do you know who it is virtually impossible not to like? Do you know who it is virtually impossible not to want to be like? Do you know whose influence it's virtually impossible to resist? Let's be those people. Let's be that person. Let's be the Samaritan. Let's change the world. And we will pick it up right there next time in part five of investigating Jesus. Here's how we know. And here's why we follow. Heavenly Father, thank you. It's more than we can bear. And yet every single one of us have been on the receiving end at some level, somebody who stopped and we're your hands and feet, whether they knew it or not. So wherever this lands with us, just give us the courage not to think about it, not to pray about it, not to be impressed by it, not to just talk about it, but to do it and use us, Father, to move the needle in our culture, in our world, Bring back the followers so that thy will can be done now in this generation in our world as it is in heaven. And I pray that in the matchless name of Jesus who led the way, paved the way, and paid the price so we could follow in Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's the challenge for all of us is to go and be doers of our faith. And, and I wanna leave you with three next steps that can help us be doers on our faith. You can do any, you can do a million things, but these are three that we wanna help you with. One thing you might uh, think is a great next step for you is baptism. We saw Leah's baptism. If you think maybe that's a great next step for you, all you need to do is go to our website and there's a baptism page. Just let us know you're interested. The next step for you is just to let us know and get more info about baptism. The next step, uh, uh, you, could, you might do is starting point. Starting point's a four-week kind of conversational environment. If you have faith questions, if you want to explore your faith, starting point is for you. And if you're here in the room right now, uh, right after we're done here in about 30 seconds in the gallery, which is right back at the back of this room, there's an orientation for starting point. You don't have to sign up for starting point. It's just a chance for you to get more info about starting point. The last thing that you might walk out of here and do is we want to offer you guys a 15-day reading plan. So this is uh, goes right along with our Investigating Jesus series. We're three weeks out from Easter. And so every weekday for three weeks, you'll receive a, an email. And in the email will be a, a, a short reading and a couple chapters in Luke, a chapter or two to read, uh, just to continue growing in your faith. And if you want to sign up, want to join that reading plan, then do this. Uh, you can scan this QR code. There are QR codes in the room here on the back of your seat. Scan that. That'll take you to a place where you can sign up to receive those emails for
for the next three weeks online. Just click the link in the chat box. But we'd love for all of you to take some kind of step in your faith and be doers of our faith. Thank you guys so much for being here. We love you, and we will see you next week. This house is now a litany Things I thought I'd never be Man who has opinions on an ottoman Among other things I used to think I'd miss the road The crushing fame, the sold out shows I just sing head, shoulders, knees and toes Like I'd forgotten them But I'm alive Baby, 